Well, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to the third Sunday of Lent here at St. Andrew's United Church. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome all within our midst and everyone that is joining us wherever they find themselves today. We had a uh, long and, and very thorough conversation at the board meeting of St. Andrew's uh, on Wednesday evening. Uh, as we are aware, and you are aware, uh, there will be a lifting of mask mandates across the province uh, tomorrow. Well, um, St. Andrews has continued to be very thorough in following the guidelines not only set out by the provincial government, uh, but also the city and taking our direction from our local health unit. And while we do recognize that uh, masking will not be necessary as of tomorrow, the Board of St. Andrews uh, continues our ongoing commitment to keeping congregants, outreach clients, and staff safe. And while masks will no longer be required, uh, for the safety and the compassion of everyone visiting St. Andrews, for the time being, we encourage the continuing of masking. Uh, March break is ending. We'd love to see how this all plays out over the next month or so, uh, when we hopefully will not have to worry. However, we will continue to look at keeping as many people as possible safe. Um, I know myself, I uh, had COVID less than four weeks ago, and I certainly wouldn't wish it <laughs> upon anyone uh, as we continue to move forward. We do recognize that this is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, and it is with the spirit of reconciliation and in living together that we honor not only our own commitment to living in right relationships, but also in the seeking of justice and understanding amongst all who live and reside within this place. Let us worship God. Out of a world of cutthroat competition, of winners and losers, and too many left behind, we come together. Out of a world of hatred, violence, individualism, and life-taking power, we gather as God's people. And so come worship the one whose love knows no limits. Swim and splash in the cleansing waters of divine community. Resurrect our spirits and souls in the worship of the one who we praise. I invite you to join in our opening hymn this morning. Words can be found at number 374 of Voices United. Come and find a quiet center, number 374.
As we quiet our spirits, the very essence of our souls, we gather together and share in prayer. Let us pray. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and spirits this morning, God, that we may be healed of our faithlessness, freed from our fears and anxieties, and placed on the pathways that lead to peace and service to you. For this is the season of turning. We are called on this journey to turn our lives towards you, O God, to turn away from all those things which have harmed us and others, to separate ourselves from actions and attitudes that demean and destroy. For it is far too easy for us to sink into the mire of self-pity and self-serving attitudes, wondering why everything isn't going our way. We desire comfort, contentment, no stress, no struggle. Yet our lives are filled with stress and discontent. And we hurt, O oh God. We hurt in our bodies, we hurt in our souls. We hurt in our relationships with others. And how we must try your patience. Forgive us, O oh God. Heal us. Empower us. Offer your grace. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us share that greeting with one another and peace today. While you're in our reading today, Luke speaks of our need to depend upon God. Jesus telling us God expects us to fulfill God's purpose, urging us to have confidence in the divine rather than self-confidence. And so if we believe this idea, then we should not fear giving of our worldly goods. God is gracious to provide for our needs, and so let us provide for others in ministry with our gifts and our offerings.
Let us pray. O God, be with us when we fear that we will want for what we need while you are with us. And as we offer the very best of ourselves, take and use all the gifts that we provide so that the needs of others can be realized. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning, as I mentioned earlier, comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. I wish it was uh, a reading filled with joy today. However, we do recognize in life, if we only lived in joy, then we would not truly experience life in a way and such that makes joy more special. For at that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found that there was none. And so he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting this soil? And he replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig round it and put manure upon it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Somewhere within this reading is wisdom. And so we give thanks to God.
Well, in my reading this, this past week um, on this passage, I, I came up with a, a grand, grand idea of, of preaching on the theme of you and I, you and I being the manure of life. The manure of life that provides the opportunity for fruit to grow. Yeah, we didn't, I didn't go very far with that one. But, uh, you know, there's wisdom in that. We were looking for wisdom in this reading, and I thought, well, maybe we're the manure of life. But each time I turned uh, to another, another page in reading or were considering it, I mean, there were things that kept popping into my mind. I mean, each and every one of us, all we have to do is turn on the television, watch the news, flip through our phones, maybe even still collect the newspaper. And what we see written is absolutely devastating and catastrophic. Not only with what's happening in Ukraine right now, but certainly we're coming upon a period of time where we're going to read about tornadoes, spring floods. Somewhere upon the earth today there's going to be an earthquake or just a tragedy. A tragedy like students driving along the road down in Texas and all of a sudden they lose their lives. Or the four who were driving in Hamilton yesterday and out of nowhere life has ended. But it's what we don't read and what we don't hear and that is unreported, which is really striking. I mean, did any of us read of the 30,000 children that died on Wednesday? Because there were approximately 30,000 children that died on Wednesday from hunger somewhere around the world. About the same number died on Tuesday and Thursday and pretty much every day of the year. And I can't help but think of the families of those children and the utter devastation that they must feel for something that is so utterly preventable. The resources of God's creation are in abundance. Yet still, so much unnecessary tragedy occurs. For in every one of those deaths, people grieve, each and every one of them. And at some level, every one of those grieving people probably asks the same question, that I ask and that I'm sure that you ask, why? It just doesn't seem fair that this continues to happen. And we ask why? What had any of those folks done to deserve such tragic deaths? Well, if we go back to Jesus' day, the life of Jesus and those around him were very different than those that we experience in the here and now. Because in Jesus' day, there was no question about fairness. There was nothing fair in life. The assumption was that disease, suffering, and death bore a direct correlation with that of human sinfulness. And so if you died or if you got a disease, or tragedy happened, there was the firm belief that your own downfalls were directly responsible for the bad things that happened to you in life. There was no notion of S, 
dot dot t happens. There was a reason why it happened and you were responsible for that reason whether you recognized it or not. And to some degree, like it or not, I think we still think this way. I mean, think about in your own experience of life, something tragic, something upsetting, something very painful happens and we wonder, what is it that we did wrong? Why did this have to happen? We scrutinize our behavior, our relationships, our diets, our beliefs, the decisions that we make, how we interact with others. We hunt for some cause to explain the effect in the hopes that we can change what we are doing so that we can stop whatever has gone wrong. Make a U-turn. Go back in time. Change what we do going forward so that we don't have to experience that again. As great and fantastic author Barbara Brown Taylor suggests, what this tells us is really that we are less interested in truth than we are consequences. Taylor goes on to say, we crave above all, what we crave above all is control over the chaos of life. It was no different in Jesus' time. People longed to understand and control misfortune, so the crowds would gather and they'd come and they'd ask Jesus about the Galileans that were slain by Pilate, and they wondered about those who were killed when the Tower of Siloam collapsed. What had these people done to deserve the situation of which they found themselves in that ended their lives? And what could have prevented it? Jesus knows what they are thinking. And he seems less pastoral in his response. We think that Jesus will say, well, they're there. I'll make it all better. But nowhere in our reading today does Jesus try to make it better for those who are struggling with these questions. Instead, he thinks, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they are worse sinners than all other Galileans? No. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or the 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And that's difficult for us to hear. Because Jesus does not really argue with a popular equation. and the understanding and the belief that there are consequences for our actions. And through those consequences of our thoughts and actions, that's directly related to bad things that happen. What he seems to want to emphasize is that death is always so close to us and not necessarily controllable or preventable. Death happens. Jesus says. Have you ever gone to a funeral or a celebration of life and walked up to the family that's grieving and said, oh well, death happens. No, of course we don't. But the reality is that's the truth. Death happens and will happen to us all. But we're so fearful of not being able to know the right thing to say that we come up with all these lines that skirt around the reality that in life there will be death. And there's no way that we can escape that. It can happen when you're driving the car. It can happen when you're standing under a sign. It 
can happen getting out of bed in the morning before you even make it to the washroom. It can happen out of complete and utter surprise. And though we might intend to be the best that we can be in life, what's to say that we'll have time to be the very best that we can be? I mean, we look for Jesus for some compassion, and we expect that he would offer that. But again, as Taylor suggests, Jesus is not aiming to comfort the crowd. Jesus came to challenge the crowd. Jesus touches the panic they have inside of them about all of the awful things that happen all around them. They are terrified of those things, and there's good reason why they are terrified about those things. They have searched their hearts for any bait that might bring disaster coming their way. They have lain awake at night making lists of their mistakes. And while Jesus does not honor their illusion that they can protect themselves in this way, Jesus does seem to honor the vulnerability that their fright has opened up in them. It's not a bad thing to feel the full fragility of life. It's not a bad thing to count breaths in the dark, not if it makes you turn towards light. And it is that turning that Jesus speaks of, which is why he tweaks their fears. Our little introduction to our opening prayer this morning, don't be afraid. My love is stronger. My love is stronger than your fears. Don't be afraid. My love is stronger, and I will always promise to be near. Fantastic words. They don't promise to take your fear away or to protect you from all of the stuff that happens in life. But what they do say is that in those times of fear, you are not alone. And so Jesus is saying, don't worry about Pilate and all the other things that have come crashing down on your heads. Stuff happens. And when stuff happens, most often, there is no blame. But don't let that stop you from doing what you are called to do. That torn place of fear has opened up inside of you a holy place. It is actually a recognition not only of the pain and the suffering and the hurt of the world, but in doing so, it opens up the possibility of something else because if we don't hear it, we don't recognize it, we don't feel it, we push it off saying it's someone else's problem, then how will it ever be recognized for what it truly is? In our faith, we're called to pay attention to what it is that we feel. And what we feel may hurt and it may be challenging, and it's not where we want to be, but that is the kind of hurt that leads to life. And so there is hard wisdom within our message today, challenging wisdom. But the reality is, is that we will never know joy without experiencing pain. Let us pray.
Generous one, you have given us everything, for you have given us yourself. You offer us a rich, satisfying feast better than anything imaginable. But instead, we often turn to our own ways. Too often we have turned your lush, rich creation into a dry, weary land by squandering your Earth's resources and polluting its fertile environment. We have hoarded much for ourselves while our fellow image bearers go without. With substance, preoccupation, and technology, we have insulated ourselves from the true call of your good news. We've held on to the things that simply make life easy for our own selfish purposes, and at the same time, ignoring your call to turn around and look into the eyes of another and see the very essence of yourselves. But still you are patient and kind and faithful to the covenant that you have made with all. And so from the bliss offered elsewhere, we turn unfulfilled to you once again. And so as we look to you, we ask that you open our eyes and ears to hear the cries of the needy, the poor, those who hunger and thirst, those without a place to rest their heads. We pray for those near and far who are struggling with injury and illness, anxiety and depression, security and unrest. We remember those who are grieving and for the victims of violence everywhere. And so awaking us to injustice and oppression. Show us our part in bringing peace to those who are living in fear and grief. For we pray for the restoration for those who are wounded by broken relationships. We pray that you would give us grace to love and to serve one another being kind and tender-hearted and putting aside all those things that get in the way of living and working as one. Precious God, take our hands. Guide us, humble us, strengthen us, melt our hearts and illuminate our minds. Cause us to hunger and thirst for you and your righteousness. Mold us and shape us and transform us by your grace that we may grow in wisdom and in confidence responding to the gospel's call until we have done all that we possibly can to bring your realm of peace to this broken world. We offer these things in the prayers of our hearts in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught all to pray, like Mother and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn of going forth this morning, number 326 from Voices United, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, number 326.
And so we are called to go, pray, and serve, and be persistent in all things of God. May God, Christ, and Holy Spirit offer you their blessing as we go this day. Amen. Thank you.